The next argument he makes um, is, is going to become crucial for his argument about the origin of language. Um, and the argument he makes next is, is, is that gesture is enough to fulfill all physical needs, that you don't need language in order to fulfill your basic physical needs. And it's actually, I think it's a kind of curious argument. Um, so um, he says, um, if the only needs we ever experienced were physical, we should most likely never have been able to speak. We would fully express our meanings by the language of gestures alone, right? And then he says, we would have been able to achieve, we would have been able to establish societies little different from those we have, or such as would have been better to achieve their goals, right? So we would have been able to institute laws, to choose leaders, to invent arts, um, to establish commerce, and to do in a word almost as many things as we do with the help of speech. Um, which to me seems a kind of broad and bold claim that we would be able to do all of this stuff without language, uh, just with, um, with gestures. And then he gives us some examples of why he thinks this is true. And he says, without fear of jealousy, the secrets of oriental gallantry are passed across the more strictly guarded harems in the epistolary language of salams. Um, and salams are the, uh, really they're supposed to be greetings. They're like Ar Arabic greetings, right? Uh, and then he gives us a, a little explanation in the footnote. He says, many very common items such as an orange, a ribbon, a charcoal, a charcoal, et cetera, are used as salams, the sending of which has a meaning known to all the lovers of the country in which this language is used. So these, this is a kind of language of gesture and not of words that he's referring to um, that can communicate something. And he gives a couple of other examples. He gives this example that these, the mutes of great nobles are able to understand each other. Right? He, he points out this fact. And then he says that the, these, these traders from India are able to transact business through these hidden handshakes. So they get some, I don't know, some handshake symbols and gestures that they're able to use to communicate to each other what's going on in secret without anybody else knowing, right? So this is the evidence that he's giving us for this. Um, again, the warrant, you know, we'd like to know, well, what, why do you think this? Why do you think that this is an example of how, um, you know, gestures are the only things that we need in order to fulfill our, fulfill our needs, and we wouldn't need language to do things like choosing leaders and inventing arts and establishing commerce, right? Um, so the one warrant that we do get uh, on, uh, on an earlier page, this is sort of a, a few pages earlier that might apply here, um, is that the language of gesture is always natural and it's never acquired. So that you've, if you've got a kind of gesture um, being used as communication, it must be a sort of a natural thing. It's not something that you, you had to, to, to learn somehow, right? So he says, although the language gesture and spoken language are equally natural, still the first is easier and depends less on <laughs> conventions, right? So conventions meaning um, a, a kind of arbitrary agreement about what a particular thing would mean, right? Um, so he has this, um, well, I guess, it, you know, at, at that point it's a claim, but it's really functioning in this other argument as the warrant, right? So it, it's really telling us So when we see these, um, these gestures, these examples ge of gestures, um, we can conclude um, that these gestures would be enough to, by themselves, communicate these meanings, um, and uh, it's because that they're, they're, they're natural. They're, you, you have a natural way of understanding them, and you don't need to have um, conventions of language in order to then be able to understand what the gestures mean. Right? And so that's why then um, that physical needs could then always be fulfilled through, um, through gestures without speech. Right? So that there's a, there's a kind of naturalness of needs and a naturalness of gestures that kind of goes together. They, they go together with each other. Right? And he uses this argument then in order then to explain the way in which animals uh, are different than humans. Right? Because he, he understands or he, he points out um, that animals also have this language of gestures. Right? So, um, so he points to beavers and ants and bees um, that have you know, they, they, they somehow cooperate, so they obviously must be communicating somehow, um, but he's indicating that um, this speech, you know, and, and so it uh, must be by gesture, that they must have this sort of gestural language that's natural to them. It's only visual, uh, but it's also something that doesn't have to be um, created by convention like human language, right? <coughs> and so, the, you know, so the main claims that he's making then um, are that animals use um, a kind of gestural language that they're born with, 
and that this animal language is always the same. So there's no variations in the types of gesture they use. It's always going to be the same gestures, right? So there's not, it's not like, you know, whatever, there's a, there's a French bee and a German bee and they can't communicate with each other. He's saying, you know, they're all, it's, they've all got that same bee language that's just a natural language of gesture. Right? And there's no, ver there's no progress either. So, you know, so like the, the bees of 200,000 years ago, they weren't any better at language than the bees that are, are now, right? There's just, uh, there's, no, there's no progress there. Whereas with human language, he's saying, oh, there's, all these, there's always variation, there's always progress. Um, and so that then he's, you know, he's saying in, in contrast to these animals, human language always is based on convention. Um, th there's, there's a kind of arbitrariness of it in the, which there needs to be agreements that have to be made in order to then come up with um, you know, what each word is supposed to mean and, and how the words are formed. And therefore there's both variation in human language, obviously, and then, but there's also progress, he's saying, in human language. Yeah? Um, and so this goes back to, then to the, that same warrant. I mean, so I, th you know, I think the warrant for this, even though he doesn't lay it out here again, it's kind of that implicit argument or that the argument that he made back on page six but that sort of is also the implicit one here um, that's backing up his or, or linking the evidence to his claim that gestures are not natural are, are natural but not and not acquired right they're, they're natural things that sort of you know are, are you, uh, that belong to kind of that same level of physical need uh, and that can the, the, that don't need to have a convention in order to to set it up right um, so this is, I, I, I think this is the way, <coughs> when you read through this text, this is the way it kind of makes sense. Uh, but there's other pieces of the text um, that kind of contradict this reading. Um, and what I want to indicate here is that there's actually a second warrant that he's got, and that it kind of changes the meaning of his text. Um, so, so we had the first one is that, um, language of gesture is always natural uh, and not acquired. He's got this other one, it's actually in the same section, where he says, um, well, uh, let me read this. It appears again by the same observations that the invention of the art of communicating our ideas depends less upon the organs we use in such communication than it does upon a power proper to man, according to which he uses his organs in this way, and which, if he lacked these, would lead him to use others to the same end. And so this is an explanation. So, so you remember he had this whole, whole thing about the, um, um, the, the, the secret handshakes uh, and these, um, um, the, the, these, these, uh, these exchanged gifts of, of the oranges and, and ribbons and charcoal um, that had this sort of symbolic meaning to them that were, was a sort of a gestural language, um, but in which people are able to use all these different means of language, so, and, the, and the mutes they're able to, to speak, even though they're, they're not using, you know, speech um, uh, or, or writing, right? And he says, well, this is an indication that humans will always be able to come up with some way of communicating their ideas, um, even if, you know, they don't have the organs with which they can do that, right? And that humans have this particular peculiar power of language that's going to uh, allow them to, 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 to you know, to, to have this kind of communication even without, you know, whatever, vocal cords or, 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 or hands even to speak, right? So um, this is a little bit different, right? Because here he's indicating um, not that the language of gesture is natural, but that language itself, a kind of human language, is natural to humans but it's not natural to animals, right? So, I mean, if we, you know, if, if we, if we go back with this one and look at his examples again, we see that the examples then, all of a sudden, we have to read them in a little bit different way because in a sense, you know, if we look at the, the, uh, the, the, the salams, right? The, with these, the orange, the ribbon, and the charcoal, I guess, you know, you'd have to say that those, you know, if apparently, you know, you, you know whatever, in, in these harems, right, this is, this is, you know, this is the way that they would be able to, to, to uh, so I, I guess the idea is that, in, um, you know, the women in the harem, they're supposed to be just for the, you know, whoever the, the husband is, right? But this sounds like they're using these secret codes in order to somehow cheat on their husbands without anybody knowing, right? But they, and using these little secret codes in order to communicate, in order to do this, right? Um, 
but we don't really know what these codes mean. The orange and the ribbon and the char charcoal is probably not a good thing, right? But orange and ribbon is probably, uh, they're probably good things. We're not sure exactly what they mean. Maybe, maybe we can sort of guess, right? Um, but there's probably something conventional about these signs, as goes with these secret handshakes. I mean, the secret handshakes, I'm sure the, whatever, the, um, the, um, the, the Indian traders, if they gave us the handshake and they gave us the, you know, the secret handshake, we probably wouldn't understand what they, were, what they were talking about in doing the secret handshake. There's probably something conventional about those gestures. They're, they're not natural signs. They're not like the, you know, the, whatever the, you know, the dancing of the bees um, that are, I guess in some sense conventional, but they're also, they're natural to the bees so that, that, that all the bees are going to understand it um, even the one from, you know, whatever, from Kazakhstan or wherever they're coming from, right? So, in a sense, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a way in which the human gestures that he's pointing to are different than the animal gestures. The human gestures here seem to depend a on a kind of innate power proper to man that's able to um, kind of co-opt these gestures in order to turn them into sort of conventional signs rather than just natural signs. Right? And so this is, seems to be the kind of second kind of argument that he's making that would make sense of these gestures, not as, uh, as, uh, as sort of natural signs, but really conventional signs. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a kind of, I think there's a kind of tension in his argument between these two ways of understanding gesture, right? Um, so he does want to insist on the sort of, um, I guess, original character of gesture as the first kind of language that's natural, and, and that's how, you know, sort of the, the human language links to the, to the animal language, but he also wants to indicate the difference, and the difference is going to lie in this um, human power, this power proper to man that um, allows humans to turn even gestures into a kind of conventional speech that's going to be like human language and not like the language of ants and bees and, uh, and beavers, right? Um, so so there does seem to be two ways of, um, I guess, reading the evidence that he's giving us, and he's even kind of indicating these two different ways of reading the evidence without actually kind of explaining to us how we're supposed to do this.